All right, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the prize. We're looking for the lady. We're looking for the lovely lady of hearts. 10 will get you 20. 10 will get you 20. Where'd the queen end up? Oh, you think it's this one? Ah, uh, better luck next time, chief. I don't know where that came from. Okay, so here's the deal. This is usually the video we do at the beginning of a smartphone year, and often one of the first companies we're talking about would be Samsung, but here we are. Vivo is getting it done. Wrapping up 2022 with tech that we're gonna be fawning over in 2023. This is the iQ 11, and I just wanted to show some of the generational improvements with the iQ 9T and the iQ 9 Pro. You might be wondering where the evolutionary gap is right here. The iQ 10 was a Chinese only variant for the brand. Spoiler right at the top of this video, we're in for a treat this year. Qualcomm has definitely shown some wonderful evolution between these three chipsets. The 9 Pro starting us off with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, the 9T stepping up to the 8 Plus Gen 1, and now here we are properly running the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 in the iQ 11. I feel vindicated. I feel like my hypothesis was correct. Qualcomm started talking about all of the improvements coming to the 8 Gen 2. We saw these huge bar graphs, enormous performance increases, even much, much more better battery lives. My guess was we were doing a comparative analysis between the 8 Gen 1 to the 8 Gen 2, not the 8 Plus Gen 1, to the 8 Gen 2. Getting these all turned on. Oh, there's the queen. <laughs> Getting these all turned on here and uh, having run a whole suite of different tests. I, I don't really lean much on synthetic benchmarks, but we can start off our conversation looking at something like a Geekbench score because everybody seems to think those numbers are really important. And here we go. Here we see some of these generational improvements and increases over processing power. Whenever I do these tests, especially on Vivos, because you can go into your battery or into your quick settings, and there's this little thing called monster mode, which kind of kicks up the CPU performance. It gives you a slightly higher thermal envelope to work in. These are the scores that I've gotten on these three phones using the highest performance tier that the phone has to offer. We can kind of see some of that trend when when Qualcomm is saying, hey, we've got like a 30% uptick to performance, that's panning out in these synthetic benchmarks. Right now, at the top of this video, what I'd like to do is send is put out the question. You know, everyone has like a, hey, drop a comment down below and smash that bell icon on your way down to the comments. I am looking, I'm constantly on the hunt for good apps that we can use to time the completion of a task. I will regularly check out things like video production if we want to time the completion of a task that way. I use the RAR app because it actually lines up pretty well with WinRAR on a PC. So you can get a pretty direct comparison between what a phone can do against a, a current Intel or AMD processor laptop or desktop. If there's another app that we can use that we can properly load everything into the phone and consistently time the same sort of test, I would really love to hear about that. Right now, performance testing is largely based on synthetic benchmark scores, that Geekbench or Antu2 score. And then we've, we've got some reviewers out there that are doing great work with games. I'm not really a nuts and bolts hardcore game benchmarker, so I'm going to leave that conversation mostly to those folks. I run a couple apps just to kind of get a lay of the land for the GPU, but I'm looking more at what else can we use our phones to do? We never have to pretend that this is average consumer. This is not priced in average consumer land. Having all of these be Vivo IQs, I feel like this is about as close as we can get to an oranges to oranges to oranges comparison. I'm not comparing a Xiaomi to a Samsung to a Vivo. Subtle differences in components, internals, and all of that other fun stuff. But again, we've got the same uh, developers and the same software engineers making the software for these phones. And I can show that all three are running Android 13. That's enough preamble. Just starting us off with one of my favorites, that video rendering test. I've now moved all of my benchmarks over to LumaFusion, not only because I, you know, I just really like LumaFusion, and it genuinely has one of the absolute fastest render engines on any of the Android apps that I've used for video editing. What's kind of interesting about LumaFusion, in terms of generational output, the 8 Gen 1 performs very similarly to the 
the 8 Plus. Going from the 9 Pro to the 9T, we see very little difference. We're in margin of error territory for how I shoot the video of and time these tests. Going to the 8 Gen 2, however, we see an almost 20% improvement to render speed. That is an enormous improvement. Think about like desktop components, how, how impressed we would be. Pop in this new GPU and you're gonna get a 20% improvement to your rendering speeds. We just don't quite see that year over year on a lot of products. For my tests, I use Audio Evolution. There aren't as many really solid multi-track audio apps in the uh, in the Android App Store. This is the one I've just been using the longest, so I'm the most familiar with it. This app did not really like the 8 Plus Gen 1. Times for processing out an hour-long podcast were faster on the 9 Pro than on the 9T. The 9T is no slouch. It cuts up an hour's worth of multi-track audio in about 90 seconds but the 9 Pro gets it done in about 80 seconds. And then we jump over to the 8 Gen 2, and that gets it done in almost a minute. Again, that is a shocking improvement, cutting 30 seconds and 20 seconds off an hour-long project file. This is faster audio editing than many good mid-spec laptops can pull off. I do a, just a really big file compression test using RAR. RAR. I do something just a little silly for my RAR test because I'm also trying to look at things like thermal performance. The collection of files that I try to compress can take over 10 minutes. And this is one of the tests that definitely got impacted by the, by the change in Android over to scoped storage. I've got editorials and videos out about that, but it was a way that Google tried to make your storage more protected, but it sapped a ton of performance from apps that really have to dig into your files. But the 8 Gen 2 has set my new record. The iQ11 is now standing at the top of the heap for this very CPU bound task, just narrowly edging out the Xiaomi 12S Ultra, showing us something that can kind of keep that performance a bit more consistent. And lastly, now my most brutal test. Again, I'm running this kind of purposely silly looking at photo processing. So I run a batch of photos through Photomate R3. I'm taking 200 RAW files from a Sony Alpha, full frame mirrorless camera. All of those RAW files, uh, they get processed, all of the colors and stuff get adjusted, they get squished down into JPEGs, and then I time halfway through. So the first batch of 100 and then the second batch of 100. So we can really see over a prolonged period of time, how much does the phone slow down kind of running a consistent workload. This is one of the things that you cannot get a sense when you're using a synthetic benchmark. When we're running a synthetic benchmark, the phone is constantly running a bunch of these tiny little tasks. It's a little burst of activity and then it moves to the next. Even when you run a synthetic benchmark over and over and over and over again, you have this spike of activity in a moment of rest. Spike of activity, moment of rest. Now there's something similar happening here where you process one photo and it loads the next. And you process one photo and it loads the next, but you're keeping a more consistent workload than shifting gears and, and testing all of these different little elements and components of what a CPU can deliver. Over the course of 200 photos, the 9 Pro is the slowest by a pretty decent margin, but it also starts out slower. At its fastest, it's slower than the 9T at its slowest, so it is trying to keep a more consistent performance. When we see that kind of thermal throttling engage, all phones will slow down over time when you give them an intense workload. It's kind of upper mid path. It's actually handling the throttling decently well. Now the 9T starts out as a screamer. It was one of the fastest phones of the year at the beginning of this test, but then throttles down a lot more by the time we get to the end of the test. The 8 Plus Gen 1 is a better version of the 8 Gen 1, but it's still an 8 Gen 1. <laughs> and then we see that generational improvement. The 8 Gen 2 is taking a similar workload and it's starting out even faster, but then it maintains just a slightly better performance with even less thermal throttling than the slower 9 Pro. It's got a little bit more performance to offer over the 9T and it can hold on to that upper tier performance a little longer than the 9T. Like I said, I don't do a ton of game reviewing, but I'm really trying to find those titles that make good use of a 120 hertz and BBK branded phones can also be a bit of a challenge. We know there's some sort of performance management happening on essentially the entire line of Oppo and Vivo and OnePlus devices. There we go. We can see that the 11 spikes 
pretty aggressively uh, into 120. I'm letting this just kind of, I can't play all three games at the same time. We don't have a proper frames per second counter in this game, but where these two phones almost consistently kind of cap you at 60 frames per second in a lot of games, this will find those moments where it's playing above 60 frames per second. Unfortunately, we've got to use the FPS monitor, the refresh rate monitor that's built into Android. And on these phones, they only kind of line up in, uh, in 30 frame per second increments. So you see 30 frames per second, 60 and 120. We can find some titles that will do better than 60 FPS. There is a little bit more headroom on the IQ 11 than on the previous 8 Plus Gen 1 and 8 Gen 1 phones. Yeah, see, we did a jump, we got it up to 120 hertz. That's something that never really happens. So I would also assume that this isn't just staying at 60 hertz for the rest of the game. Um, it's probably, the frame rate is probably staying above 60. It's just we're only getting those little flavors of it. Another older game that I just like to keep an eye on is Bright Ridge. It's a fantasy exploration game and it does have its own built-in FPS meter. But one of the reasons why I like checking out Bright Ridge is that it has very granular PC-like graphics controls. We can see, oh, like no issues. I think this game sort of peaks at 60 FPS. I don't really, I don't think I've ever seen it driven faster than that on any phone. And one of the things that we've got to keep an eye on, when you first fire up the game, it doesn't look that great because we're probably playing it with the lowest textures, with the uh, lowest resolution. So this is rendering the game at 640 by 360. Oh wow, we can get 60 frames per second in 360p. So I'm gonna go through all of these quality settings on all these phones, and then you can see what some of those actual real world differences are like once we move these up to proper, at least proper 1080p gaming. Okay, quality improvements, better shadows, longer draw distance, more lush greenery. These This game actually still looks really pretty even considering it's got like, kind of PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3 era graphics. Immediately we see two things here though. 8 Gen 1 on the iQ9 Pro immediately dips below 60 frames per second. We're, we're taking like 10% off of that, uh, hovering between like 52 and 57 frames per second. The 9T with the 8 Plus Gen 1 is staying right around 60 with little dips into the 59s. The <laughs> iQ11 on the 8 Gen 2 um, if you see a tiny little dip into the 59s, it's almost perfectly staying above 60 just for this loadout. We're not moving, we're not running, it's not having to draw anything else farther in the distance. This is just immediately we see that frame drop on the GPU on the iQ9 Pro. And I've been testing this game for years. You're just going to have to take my word for it that this is the smoothest gameplay we've ever seen on an Android running full 1080p resolution and the highest uh, graphic settings in this game. This game has been around forever. And uh, it, it's, it's actually pretty impressive that it's only till now that we've seen any phone really try and uh, max out all these quality settings and still stay uh, really decently into the high 50s and uh, at 60 frames per second. The iQ9 Pro is still a champ. I mean, this is a beastly powerful processor, but where we only saw dips down into like the 55s, we'll occasionally see dips here down into the 40s. So here we're, we're rounding that ridge and you can noticeably see now that we're down to like 40 frames per second, that has a, <laughs> that is a very note, a 20 fr uh, frame per second drop is a very noticeable difference in, uh, in the fluidity of your gaming experience, which is probably about as a good a place as any to start wrapping this video up. I am super excited. Uh, first of all, I'm super excited and a huge thank you to Vivo and iCoop for setting all of this up because getting to see this generationally on the same line of products is really insightful. It really helps to have a similar feel per phone and then compare those performance differences. This is that part of the video where I say, hey, we're really in for a treat. The 8 Gen 2 is finally real realizing all of the promises that we've had since the Snapdragon 888 and the 8 Gen 1, a higher tier of performance with a little bit better battery life and a little bit more consistent tier of performance. But this is also the place where I've got to reiterate, these phones are high performance handsets. You should not feel bad if you have an iQ9 Pro. This thing is still a monster performer when you hit it with those 
harder tasks, the tasks that we've been showing here. If you've been watching this video and you have that inkling to go down into the comments and say something like, oh, but who does things on their phones in a world where people are doing composite videos with green screening on TikTok, then you're really bad at technology. You shouldn't be that techie. You should try to get more use out of your phone and there are good reasons to step up to more expensive phones when you do that. And that's why we've got to do a more consistent job of testing them beyond just looking at some of the synthetic benchmarks. If we just looked at Geekbench scores, we really wouldn't have as good a sense of one phone's a little bit a little bit better at audio processing, another phone is a little bit better at video and rendering. Uh, we can look at the Pixel as a perfect example of kind of upsetting the Apple cart on that kind of scoring. And the last note to go out on is just seeing how exciting the competition is getting internationally, where the iQ11 is making it out to more markets. This isn't just a Chinese first phone, well outpacing Samsung in a lot of the territories where Samsung can compete really well. We unfortunately won't get something like this here in the United States, and that's a shame because people are already getting to play with next year technology this year. As a big old North American tech nerd, that makes me really sad. Emphasis with my finger. Hopefully you find this kind of stuff interesting because I really do genuinely want to know if I'm going to spend more on a phone, can it really do more? I'm not looking to spend a thousand dollars on a phone so I can be average. As always folks, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All of the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Oh, there's that queen of hearts again. Liking, sharing, and subscribing is always greatly appreciated. Those of you who are clicking links down in my description, if you're heading to my home site, somegadgetguide.com, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on, my, on your screen from my Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com com slash some gadget guy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, not so much on the Facebooks or the Instagrams, but now I'm also very much on the Mastodons. You can join me over on techhub.social on Mastodon, and I will catch you all on the next video.